Let's pray. Father, we come before you this hour, and what an appropriate song for this morning, even when the whole earth shakes. We see your love and your mercy and your grace and your presence and your activity in our lives. And so, Lord, we pray that we would see that in the time to come. Father, that you would reveal your word to us and Father, that you would just speak to us clearly through your spirit as we have gathered here this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for who you are, for all that you do, and for the many different ways that you impact our lives on a daily and even moment by moment and minute by minute basis. Lord, reveal your word to us this hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you are familiar with the phrase, raise your hand, familiar with the phrase, going out of your way? Okay, good, most of you. By show of hands or amen, if you don't want to keep raising your hand, you can just amen, get your amen or going this morning. Um, by show of hands or amen or like buttons if you're out there watching us uh, live this morning, how many of you have ever gone out of your way for your spouse? Most of you. Okay, good. How many of you have ever gone out of the way for your children? <laughs> I got some amens on that one. How many of you have ever gone out of your way for your boss or your supervisor? Yeah. Anybody ever gone out of their way for a friend? Yeah. Have you ever gone out of your way for a stranger? We've all done that, haven't we? Oh, I know you've done this one. How many of you have gone out of your way for yourself? Uh, you don't want to admit it, but you have, haven't you? Yeah, you have. If there's anybody we're going to go out of our way for, it's us. Now, if you didn't raise your hand, or if you didn't amen, or if you didn't hit that like button out there, to any of those, um, can I just say this with love? There's probably something wrong with you. You, you probably either ought to go get you an extra cup of coffee back there in the back and wake up a little bit or maybe turn your hearing aid up or something because we we're all have gone out of our way for somebody at some point and some time in our life. Amen? Amen? Going out of the way is a part of life. It's a part of the journey. It's a part of the process. We've all done it. We all have to do it. And you know what else? We've all had somebody do it for us, haven't we? How many of you have ever had somebody go out of their way for you? Every single one of us. But you know, here's what I was thinking about this week. As, as normal as that is, and as much as we do it, and this is a very uncomfortable reality, by the way. As normal as it is, and as much as we do it, this going out of the way for each other, even with all the practice you've had with that, we don't really like it, do we? We don't really like to go out of the way for people. I mean, none of us wake up in the morning and, and, and go, you know, I sure hope my day gets interrupted today. I sure hope I get to go out of my way for somebody else today, do we? None of us wake up and, and think, Man, I sure hope today while I'm super busy doing all my stuff, trying to get my work done, trying to accomplish my tasks, I sure hope today somebody, anybody calls on me or sends me a text or an email and gives me the great honor and opportunity to drop everything I'm doing and go out of my way for them. I sure hope that happens. None of us like to go out of our way, do we? I mean, if we're really being honest, that's the uncomfortable reality about it. We do it a lot, but we don't, we don't really like it. Can I, can I give you three reasons why we don't like it? These are the first three blanks there on your, your bulletin. And these are just words to kind of sum up bigger ideas around it. But the first one would be prioritization. That's a big one. We'll put it on the screen for you. We don't like to go out of our way for somebody else, for anybody else, for that matter, because when we're going out of our way for somebody else, it means you have to put yourself, 
your task, your needs, your wants, your desires, your dreams, your agenda, your to-do list, whatever it was you were doing, you have to put all of that aside so you can go out of your way for them. Anytime you're going out of your way for somebody else, there's a shuffling of the priorities in your life, isn't there? And that's uncomfortable. We don't like it. Second word would be preoccupation. We, we don't like to go out of our way. It's not natural to want to go out of our way because let's be honest, we're busy people, amen? We got stuff going on. We, we have plans. We have agendas. When we wake up in the morning, we have an idea of how today is going to go. We have an idea of the things we need to accomplish and the things we need to get done. At the beginning of the week, you have an idea of what you need to accomplish that week or that month. We're so preoccupied with our own lives and we're so preoccupied with trying to get our own stuff done. We're so preoccupied with trying to keep our our own lives together and staying on pace and on schedule that any time we have to go out of our way for somebody else, it becomes a major sacrifice because we are busy people. Some of y'all are so busy, um, you don't even make your own food anymore. You eat out all the time, don't you? Because you're busy. Some of y'all are even busier than that, though. It's not just you eat out all the time. You have to drive through. You're so busy. You, you can't even just go eat out. You got to drive through. That's, that's busy. Some of y'all, though, are even busier than that, more preoccupied than that with life. You're so preoccupied with life and you're so busy, you don't even have time to drive through anymore. So you order it, DoorDash, <laughs> Uber Eats. Have it deliver them to you wherever you're at, your office, the kids' game, your living room, (laughs) wherever. Like some of us are so preoccupied and so busy with life, it's not even that we just can't even make our food, we can't even go through the drive-thru to pick it up ourselves. You pay somebody else to go out of their way (laughs) to bring food or whatever you need your way. Now, I'm being a little silly here, right? But I'm trying to make a point. As a culture, we're super preoccupied and super busy and super overwhelmed. And because of that, it's inconvenient to go out of our way for other people. The third one is one you'll be very familiar with. It's the word procrastination. When when we see a need that's going to require us to go out of our way to meet that need for somebody else, it is so easy to just put it off. It's so easy to procrastinate. Well, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll help them tomorrow. Or as soon as I get a day, a free day, I'll help you do that. Or um, one that I've heard a lot and one that I've said a lot When I catch my breath, I'll do it. I'll help you. I'll make some time for that next week. I'll make some time for that tomorrow. We put it off. We procrastinate because we know that the other person that we're going out of our way for understands we're busy people. We know that they know that they're asking us to go out of our way for them. And we know that they ultimately will understand why we have to put that off for a little bit. So we just don't do it. We procrastinate with the hope and the prayer that in the meantime, somebody else will go out of their way and do that for them so we don't have to. In this series, we've been talking about how Jesus was so good at dealing with people one at a time. And we've talked a lot about how Jesus did these one-at-a-time things, and these one-at-a-time things happened as he was just going along the way. But there's something else that's very obvious and very apparent in so many of these one-on-one counters. And it's not that Jesus let these things happen or, or had these things happen along the way. The other obvious aspect of this is that many times Jesus went out of his way. 
And so church, what I'm trying to tell you is this. If, if we're going to live like Jesus, if we're going to love like Jesus, if we're going to fulfill our calling in Christ and walk that worthy walk that we have been called to walk, then I suspect there are going to be many times in life that just like Jesus, we're going to have to be willing to go out of our way for others. It's not always going to happen along the way. Sometimes it's going to happen when we go out of our way. If we're going to live like this, then we have to understand several key things. And the first is actually our big idea for the day, the one we're going to come back to, the one that holds all of this together, and that is this. We have to understand that sometimes God's way requires us to go out of the way. Sometimes God's way and God's will is going to require you and me and us to go out of the way. Have any of y'all ever noticed how God's way is not always your way you've noticed that too his way is not my way his way is not your way his way is his way if you've noticed that if you've noticed that God's way is not always your way you've probably also noticed by this point in your life that God's way is always the better way that God's way really and truly is the only right way And my friends, what I want you to get today is that sometimes God's way, the right way, the better way, the best way, requires you and me and us to go out of our way. Sometimes God's way is not just going to require us to go out of our way. Sometimes God's way is going to get in our way. And we don't like the thought of that. I mean, that's kind of uncomfortable. Three key things that I want to point out in our text for today, if we really believe that sometimes God's way requires us to go out of the way, then we need to look at these three things, because going out of our way is never natural, it's never easy, but it's possible when we understand these things that Jesus understood. Our text today is in Mark chapter 5, let me read to you just the first two verses as we begin. If you have your Bibles, read with me. It says in verse number one, they came to the other side of the sea. In other words, this wasn't along the way. This was out of the way. To the region of the Gerasians. And as soon as he, Jesus, got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. So this is not on his way. This was out of his way. It's on the other side of the sea, the other side of the Sea of Galilee, the other side from where he was, Jesus had to go out of his way to have this encounter with this man. And we might ask ourselves, well, why would Jesus do this? Why would he go so far out of his way for one man? Well, I think it begins with understanding this first point that can be summed up with the word purpose. Purpose. I don't want you to answer this one out loud. I don't want you to raise your hand. I don't want you to say amen. But if I asked you right now, just in your head and in your heart, to contemplate this question, what would you say? The question is this What is your purpose in life? Do do you have an answer for that question? Do you know what your purpose is? Do you know why God has you here? Do you know what God has created you to do? Are you absolutely sure and absolutely positive about your purpose? You see, this is an important question because this will in large part determine if you or I are ever willing to go out of our way or not. Because if you know your purpose, and if part of your purpose requires you to go out of your way, you'll do it. You're more willing to do it because you know it's your purpose. But if you don't know your purpose, if you have no idea what your purpose is, if 
you, you think you just exist and you just live here and God has no purpose for you, well, then you're not near as likely to go out of your way or to be willing to go out of your way for somebody else because it doesn't have anything to do with your purpose. You're not going to want to take the time if you don't know your purpose. You're not going to want to take the risk if you don't know your purpose. You're not going to want to put forth the effort if you don't know your purpose. You see, for, for most of us, there has to be a good reason to go out of our way for somebody else. We're not going to just do it for anyone. We're not going to just do it at any time. We're not going to just do it for any reason. And that's why it's important that you know your purpose. See, Jesus understood what his purpose was. He knew exactly why he was here. He knew exactly why he had been sent. He understood his purpose. We see it all over the scriptures. Luke 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. That's his purpose. So even though this man is out of his way on the other side of the sea, far from where he was, he was willing to go out of his way to accomplish part of his purpose, to seek and save the lost. He was here to rescue the lost. Jesus was sent from heaven to rescue us from the dominion of darkness. According to Paul in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. In Him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus understood His purpose. And so that's why it was nothing for Him to go to the other side, out of His way, to rescue this man from the darkness He was in. In 1 John, it records this, in chapter 3, verse 8. The one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. And the Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. So you can see that that Jesus wasn't just going out of his way for another cool story. He wasn't just going out of his way for another cool encounter. He wasn't just going out of his way so people would write something about him. He was going out of his way to fulfill his purpose. He was going out of his way, in this case, to meet this one man, to destroy the devil's works, to deliver him from darkness, to seek and save the lost. It's tied to his purpose. Read it with me. Mark 5, 1 through 8. They came to the other side of the sea, the region of the Gerasians, and as soon as he got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tomb and met him. He lived in the tombs. No one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with the chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but had torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. This sounds very ominous. Sounds very impossible. Sounds very difficult, doesn't it? Night and day, verse 5, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Sounds very desperate. And when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran not away from Jesus, but he ran to Jesus and he knelt down before him and he cried out with a loud voice what do you have to do with me Jesus son of the most high God I beg you before God don't torment me for he had told him come out of the man you unclean spirit the story takes place in what in modern day they call cursey It's not a place many church tours go on their journeys to the Holy Land. It's one I attempt to take our tours to when we can fit it in. I'll tell you why people don't go there. You want to know why? It's out of the way. Simple. Still to this day, it's out of the way. It's all the way on the other side. 
Not much happened over there because Jesus wasn't welcomed over there. It's out of the way. There's not much there. I mean, the cliff is still there that the pigs ultimately jump off of. The tombs are still there in the the mountain. You can see them. There's there's just this little building that kind of marks the spot that this happened. You don't find much there, but boy, it, it provides a very unique perspective and a powerful perspective, not only of the geography of the region, but a unique perspective of the ministry of Jesus, and more importantly, the love that he had for all people and his willingness to go out of the way to meet with this man. Now, before we even get to this, if you look back into Mark 4, you're going to see that he didn't just go out of the way, but this took some effort. They didn't just cross over to the other side to have this encounter with this man. They went through a horrific storm in the process of getting to him. There's some demonic connotations to that storm. We don't have time to unpack today as well, but I just want to make the point, this was out of the way and this was a difficult journey. It was filled with risk. It wasn't a place they were welcome. It wasn't a place they were going to. It wasn't a place they would normally visit because Jesus, as a Jew, would not have been welcomed in this region. But he still went. He went out of his way. He went through the storm. He went to a place where he was not welcome, a place where his ministry was not understood or accepted because he understood his purpose. You see, you and I are always more likely and more willing to go out of our way when we understand our purpose and when we're passionate about it. Because some people understand their purpose as a believer and their purpose that God has given them, but they're just not passionate about it anymore. It's not enough just to understand your purpose. You also have to be passionate about the purpose God has given you. Now, in a perfect world, we would never have to go out of our way, but we don't live in a perfect world, do we? And can I just make this point? Neither did Jesus. He lived in the same world you and I live in. And even in his day, it wasn't a perfect world. And so there were many times, like this one, where he had to go out of his way for other people. Sometimes God's way requires us to go out of the way. And we're more likely to do that, we're more likely to accept that if we're certain of what our purpose is. Here's the second thing we have to understand. The second thing that will put us in a better position and give us a better perspective to be willing to go out of the way for others and for God. It's the word power. Again, I'm using the word to sum up a much larger idea You see, I'm convinced that one of the biggest reasons why most of us are unwilling to go out of our way is not just that we don't understand our purpose, but many times it's also because we feel like we don't have any power to make a difference. So why would we go through the trouble? Why would we take the risk? Why would we put forth the effort? Why would we face the potential heartache and headache if we don't have any power to change anything. Think about the times you've gone out of your way for people. You've gone out of your way for people when you thought you had the power to make a difference. When you thought you could make an impact. When you thought your presence was going to produce something. When you felt like whatever it was they asked you to do or you felt like you needed to do, going out of your way for them was going to matter. Now think about the times you didn't go out of your way. I guarantee you many of those times you didn't go out of your way because you told yourself in your head or in your heart, you convinced yourself in some form or some fashion that you didn't have any power to change it, that you couldn't make a difference, that that you being there wouldn't matter, that you were powerless in that situation. And you see, when, when we feel like we're powerless we're always much less likely to go out of our way to help somebody. Jesus went out of his way because he knew he had the power to help. From the moment Jesus shows up, 
The demons are in full retreat. I love this about this text. Look at verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt before him, and he cried out with a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus? This isn't the man. This is the demon. What do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? He knows who Jesus is. He begs him then, I beg you, before God, don't torment me. He he knew he had no chance against Jesus. It says, for he had told him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Jesus had the power to help, but he had to go out of his way to help. I love what one commentator wrote about this. He said, seeing Jesus from a distance, the demons who indwelt this man could sense the presence of the glorious king of the universe, and they panicked. What no human being could tame, even through the use of ropes and chains, Jesus restrained with nothing more than his presence. The demons were fully acquainted with the Son of God and aware of their inability to resist his power. They knew they didn't stand a chance. They're in full retreat from the moment they see Jesus from a distance. Luke's gospel records of this encounter in Luke chapter 8, verse 31. And they begged him, the demons, they begged him not to banish them to the abyss. These demons didn't dispute the fact that they were totally defeated. They didn't dispute the fact that They had no power in the presence of Jesus. They knew all they could do was beg Jesus not to cast them directly into the pit from that very moment. They're begging Jesus for just a little more time because they know that's the best they can do. They don't even try to dispute the power that Jesus has over them. The point I want to make is that Jesus went out of his way to help this man because he knew he had a purpose to fulfill and he knew he had the power to make a difference. Church, I know God has a purpose for each and every one of you. And I know God has given you the power to make a difference. Because God never gives a man or a woman a purpose unless he gives them the power to fulfill it. The Bible expresses the power you have. If you would allow me to quickly remind you of some of your power, because many of you have forgotten. This isn't an exhaustive list. It's all that I felt I could squeeze in, though. First, we're told that we possess the power of love and sound judgment and self-discipline in places like 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love. And sound judgment. Jesus told the disciples that we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know how much more power you want. I don't know where you think you're going to get better power than the Holy Spirit. How much more power could you have, possibly, than God indwelling you and living inside of you? Listen to this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now that's some power. That's Holy Spirit power. In Matthew 28, the Great Commission, Jesus says he has all authority and that he would be with us to the very end of the age. That means we have some power, doesn't it? That means he's given us some power for this journey. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And he said, Remember. I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Some of y'all have forgotten that. He's with you. He's with you always to the very end of the age. Has Has the end of the age happened yet? If it hasn't happened, then he's still with you. 
You have some power, is my point. Paul knew about this power. He talked about it often. Philippians 4.13, I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. He understood the power. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 21, Paul says, I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and the width and the height and the depth of God's love. And to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, look at this, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul knew of this power. To the Colossians, he wrote in chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may give great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance and the light. To the Corinthians, he writes, 1 Corinthians 2, 3 through 5, I came to you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a what? Demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. In chapter 6, he speaks of the ultimate power, my favorite kind of power, resurrection power. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, God raised up the Lord and he will also raise us up by his power. You're not weak. You're not helpless. You're not powerless. You are a child of God. You are an heir to the kingdom of God. You're loved by the, the creator of the universe. You're saved by the blood of the Lamb. You're redeemed by the Alpha and the Omega. The King of Kings knows your name. The Lord of Lords calls you friend. That makes you many things, and one of them is powerful. Peter said in 2 Peter 1.3, His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. You're not missing nothing you need. His power is enough. His power is sufficient. His power is yours. His power is available to you. His power lives inside of you. And see, when you realize you have this power, when you recognize you have this power, when you believe you have this power, then you know you can make a difference wherever God sends you, especially when it's out of the way. And when you understand you have that power, you might just be willing to go out of your way even when, in this case, for Jesus, it looks impossible, it looks scary, it looks like nothing could change. A lot of people have tried to help this man. But Jesus still went because he knew he had the power to help. You see, sometimes God's way requires us to go out of the way. But you're never going to be willing to go out of the way if you keep thinking you don't have any power to do anything. Knowing your purpose will give you the courage to go out of your way, but knowing your power will give you the courage to go out of your way for those you don't even think you can help. Because you know it's not your power that helps them anyway, it's his. Then we have our last point. It's the word proclamation. Jesus was willing to go far out of his way because he knew his purpose. 
He was willing to go far out of his way because he knew he had the power to help. But he also knew this little trip was going to bring great glory to God. He knew at the end of it all, there was going to be a great proclamation of the gospel that was going to occur following the transformation of this person's life. Look back to the text in verse 11. A large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him, send us to the pigs so that we may enter them. So he gave them permission And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned there. The men who tended them ran off and they reported it to the town, tattletales, and the countryside. And the people went to see what had happened. The proclamation has already begun. They came to Jesus and they saw the man who had been demon-possessed sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Seems like a strange reaction, but when you really understand the magnitude of what they're looking at and seeing, maybe not so strange at all. And then verse 16 says, Those who had seen it described it to them, what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs. And then they began to beg him to leave their region. Get out of here. You're not welcome here. And it says, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. And Jesus did not let him, but told him, go home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So he went, he went out and he began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And they were all amazed. It's funny that they were afraid of Jesus, but they were amazed at the testimony of the man. There's a lot of confusion around this text. Some have attempted to use this text to suggest that Jesus compromised with the demons. Others who, in my opinion, do not understand the gospel or the Bible have gone so far as to say that this was more than a compromise. This was the Son of God showing compassion on the demons by allowing them to enter the pigs. Church, can I tell you both of those things are wrong? Verse 13 says that Jesus permitted, he gave them permission. He permitted it. He permitted them to go into those pigs. He permitted the unclean spirits to go into unclean animals. He gave them permission because he was in control of the entire situation. He had total authority over it. He gave them permission so that his power and his purpose could be manifested in a visible way. So that it would be absolutely undeniable and undisputable. It would be 100% unquestionable that what he did in verse 14, 15, and 16, that all of that would happen for this proclamation of the glory and the goodness and the grace of God. He didn't want to just poof, make these things go away. He wanted the people to see it. He wanted them to see the power of God. He wanted them to see the love of God. He wanted them to see the grace and the goodness and the glory of God. So he permitted it. And in verse 14 it says, The man who tended them ran off and reported it to the town and the countryside, and the people went to see what had happened. People talked about it. They wanted to see it. They came to take a look at who is this man. All because Jesus permitted those unclean spirits to enter those unclean animals. And then there's this even far more reaching and longer lasting proclamation that takes place in verses 18 through 20. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had the demon 
begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. And Jesus didn't let him, but told him, go home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. And it says, so he went out. And he began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And they were all amazed. He went and told other people about how God had changed his life. You see, I bet you would be more willing to go out of your way if you knew that going out of your way, doing that for somebody else might change their life, wouldn't you? If you knew that going out of your way for somebody was going to change their life like this, I bet you would do it every time, wouldn't you? If you knew that you going out of your way might result in that person going forth and proclaiming the gospel to somebody else, you would do it. If you knew that going out of your way might bring such a radical transformation into somebody's life, that they would spend the rest of their life telling people about the glory and the goodness and the grace of God. I bet you would do it. And see, the reality is, is every time we go out of our way, there's a potential for that proclamation. But we forget it so quickly, don't we? We forget that every time God's way requires us to go out of the way and there's a purpose for us to go, and there's power in which we go, that there's this great potential for this massive proclamation of the goodness and the glory of God on the backside of it. But we don't remember that. And so many times we talk ourselves out of going out of the way instead of into it. Sometimes God's way requires us, demands us, compels us, and even commands us to go out of the way. Church, I want to encourage you and challenge you this week to keep your eyes, your ears, and most importantly, your hearts open this week. Because you know what? I can almost guarantee you there's going to come a chance, there's going to come a moment for each and every one of us when we are going to have the opportunity to go out of the way for somebody this week. And when that time comes, I hope you remember your purpose. I pray you remember the power in which God is sending you. And I pray you can look far enough down the road to see that there might just indeed be a great proclamation that will happen because you do it. Remember that sometimes God's way requires you and me and us to go out of the way. You know, there's no larger or more pressing reminder of these truths in your life or mine than the reality of the cross. The Bible says that Jesus came from heaven to earth to die for you. That's a little bit out of the way, don't you think? He left heaven, a perfect place, a sinless place, a place where he was worshipped and adored, praised and honored and glorified, a place where he was loved. He left that place to come to this place, a little out of the way, and he lived here for 33 years, where he was mostly mocked and hated and tormented and tortured and falsely accused. And at the end of it all, for all of his trouble, we murdered him in the most painful, awful most humiliating way a man can die naked on a cross on a hill up above a city for all to see. Now, I don't know about you, but leaving heaven to come to earth to live that kind of life seems a little out of the way. But can I remind you one more time, God's way sometimes is out of the way. Maybe that's what the cross shows us. That Jesus did all of that for you. He lived that sinless life for 33 years here for you. He died for you. He went through all of that for you. He went way out of his way for you. He died a sinner's death so you, the sinner, wouldn't have to. He rose from the, the grave and conquered death so that it could be defeated for you. 
He went a really long way out of the way for you and for me so we could be saved. Maybe you're here today and you're not saved. Maybe you've never realized Jesus went out of the way for you, but he did. He did it just for you because he loves you and he cares about you because he wants to spend eternity with you. If you've never repented of your sins, if you've never given your life to Jesus, I would ask you to consider doing that today. Submit your life to him. Give your life to him. Not out of obligation because he went out of the way, but because you want your life to be changed and transformed just like this man we've read about today, just like many of the people sitting to your right and left, just like many of those who are worshiping online or listening on the radio this very hour. Repent and be saved. Call on the name of Jesus this hour for the forgiveness of your sins. If the cross shows us nothing else, it shows us that sometimes God's way is out of the way. He did it for you. He did it for me. Accept it. Believe it. Call on it today. Let's pray. If that's you and you're here this hour or can hear my voice this hour and have never given your life to Jesus, we invite you to do so. Just pray with me wherever you are. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've gone astray and messed things up. And so today by faith I ask that you would change me. By faith, I ask that you would make me new. Lord, by faith, I ask that you would forgive me. Because I know that's something only you can do. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love, and for your mercy. Lord, I thank you for going out of your way for me Lord as we close this hour we are amazed and in awe of and hopefully Lord inspired by the fact that you would do such a thing for us Lord I pray that this day and this time in your word has encouraged us and equipped us to be willing to do a similar thing for others to go out of the way to meet people where they are one at a time because you do have a great purpose for our life you indwell us and empower us with a great power to make a difference and that it's one life at a time the gospel is proclaimed it's one transformation at a time that it goes forth So, Lord, I pray that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear. The courage and the boldness to be one at a time people, even if it means going a long way out of the way. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask and we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.